Well, turn with me to First Epistle of John, chapter four. First Epistle of John, chapter four. Now we've been talking about the fact that the revelation of Christ in you is the most important revelation that you and I can have as a believer. Today we're going to focus, last week we talked about a hope that is from God. Today we're going to talk about a faith that is from God. But the revelation of Christ in you, that becoming real, being awake to that, having comprehension of that, functioning in and from that nature and Christ that is in you is the most important thing for you and I as believers. First Epistle of John chapter 4 and verse 9 says, In this was manifest the love of God. In this was manifest the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That we might live through him. He has come to give us his life. There is an exchange of life that has taken place. Where we are no longer to be living our life, but we are to live his life. And it is his life be that is being lived through us. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 15 and 16, it's Paul says, By the Spirit of God, when it pleased of God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace. He called me by his grace. What for? To reveal his son in me. And that I might preach him. Christ in me. Revealed in me. That I might preach him among the heathen. Those people that were without God. And immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. I was faithful to that heavenly vision. To do what? To declare him and to preach him and to proclaim him that is in me, that is revealed in me. So the very essence of Christianity and the whole purpose of God is wrapped up in this reality that it is the life of Christ that is in you and that we are to function in and through that life. Colossians, Galatians 1 verse 27 says, speaks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 says, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I don't draw back from the gospel. I, I have a boldness. I have a confidence. I have a plainness of speech. I, I have, there is no shame. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the reality of Christ in me. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the reality of Christ in me is the power and the supernatural ability of God to bring forth change. It is the power of God unto salvation. That Christ in you, that life, that nature, that person of Christ that is in you is the power and the ability of God to bring forth and to cause the manifestation of salvation, deliverance, wholeness, preservation, prosperity, and the manifest goodness of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. And the reason why it is the power, it is such power of God unto salvation, as it says, is because in that gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. In that gospel, the reality of this oneness that you have with God in Christ is unveiled. In this gospel, it is revealed this righteousness, this authority that we have. These rights and privileges that we now have as the sons of God. This freedom from condemnation and insecurity being brought to a place of justification just as if sin has never been. Therefore, this righteousness, this gospel is the power of God unto salvation because in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Amen? What is the essence of it all? It's Christ in you. Galatians 2.20 says, by the faith of the operation of God, what has been accomplished is this, that it is no longer you that live, but it is Christ that liveth in you. The old man has been crucified. You are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. You are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live, yet it is not you, but it is Christ that liveth in you. It is him. It is his nature. It is his love shed abroad in your heart. It is Christ. It is the nature of God. It is Christ in you. And the life that you now live, it is his life, and you live it by the 
faith of the Son of God. By, the, by his faith, the faith that God has given to you. Amen? You are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. When Christ that is in you, Colossians 3, verse 3 and 4, when Christ in you, when he shall appear, when he is unveiled, then you will come to recognize who you really are. Because as he is, so are you in this world. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So it is about that life. It is about that nature. This is the most important revelation, a comprehension that we are to get a hold of and walk in. And God has promised. He, Jesus says, look, don't be like the Gentiles, consumed with what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and be driven by this whole need business. He says, this is what you do. I'm, I know, I, the, the Father knows you have need of these things. And the Father, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Father's will is that all every need might be met. The Father's will is that he has given you all things richly to enjoy. But don't be consumed by what you eat and what you drink and about tomorrow and all these other things the way the Gentiles do. The way the Gentiles pursue it in the vanity of their minds. But what should you do? You are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are to pursue that realm where God reigns and dominates and his righteousness, this oneness. Let that be your focus, and all these other things shall be added unto you. That's, again, talking about that Christ in you. It's talking about that nature. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, All the promises of God in him are yes and amen. Are all the promises of God yes and amen? That's not what it says. It says all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. Amen? <laughs> it's in him. So that's what it's about. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 20 says, He's given unto us great and precious promises that by these we might partake of or we might, we might take a hold or take that part of what? The divine nature. And as that divine nature is manifested, you escape the corruption that is in the world. Amen? And you can have the promises of God, you can have the hope of God, you can have the plan of God, the purposes of God fulfilled. Why? Because of that life being made manifested. So it is about the life of Christ. It's the life of Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now let's flip to 2 Timothy. Actually, no, we're going to turn with me to 1 John. No, John, John, the Gospel of John chapter 1. While you turn there, let me make this statement. When you were born again, you were born Again to what? What were you born again to? Huh? New creation. John chapter 1. While you're turning there, let me, let me give you this verse of scripture as well. Um, which is a scripture you should memorize. You should have some stars, asterisks around it. That page should probably be a little bit you know, beginning, if, if you use it enough, you probably have a little bit of tear here and there because you're there so often. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Let me just um, go through that first. It talks about the fact that he who had saved us had passed and saved us, delivered us, and called us with a holy calling. A calling that is holy. A calling that leads, that is so holy, it leads to holiness. It leads to a life of consecration. It leads to a life that is so separated unto him. It leads to a life of sanctification. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3, this is the will of God, even our sanctification, even this separation unto him. Where the reality of it is, is that it's no longer you, but it is Christ that liveth in you. You are called to this. You are called to holiness. You are called to sanctification. Where for you to live is Christ and to die is gain. You are called into this oneness. You are called into this place where Christ is so formed in you that he takes you over. Where the spirit of the Lord is, where it is his life. Amen? That's going to be a very, very important thought in order to function in that nature. Because functioning in that nature, part and parcel of functioning in him, is functioning in the reality that you are crucified and it's no longer you. Hello? Anyway, so it says, who had saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, not according to anything that we have done, 
but according to his own purpose and grace. Say grace. Which was, say was, which was given us in Christ Jesus when? Before the world began. Did it say that? All right. But it is now made manifest by the appearing and the unveiling of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who had abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. Okay. So what it is we are born again to? We are born again to the purpose. We are born again to the grace. We are born again to all these things that were given before the foundation of the world. But they begin to become manifest at the unveiling and at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the more Christ in you is unveiled, then the more these things that you are called to, more these things that you were born again to, the more these things begin to become a living reality and functional in our lives. Amen? All right. But I want to focus on the grace just for a moment. John chapter, John chapter 1 and verse 11 but let's pick it up in verse 13. It says, being born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That glory is full of grace and truth. That gives you some insight into the glory full of grace and truth. He's begotten us again and we receive from his from, um, begotten son received from his father full of grace, favor, loving kindness and truth. Now John bear witness of him and cried saying, this was he of whom we spake. He that cometh after me is, is preferred before me for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. The Amplified says, out of his fullness, his abundance, say abundance. We have all received, we have all had a share, and we were all supplied with one grace after another, and spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, and even favor upon favor, gift heaped upon gift. What am I saying? You are born again to an abundance of grace. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. The Amplified says, For the grace of God, His unmerited favor and blessing has come forward appeared for the deliverance from sin and eternal salvation, and it has come for all men. Say all mankind. Abundance of grace. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. What I want you to see is that there is an abundance of grace that has been poured out, and you are born again to it, and it was not according to your works. If it is of works, then it is not grace. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the, simil the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the fig of him that was to come, but not as the offense, so also is the gift, the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more, say much more, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, had abounded unto many. Say many. I'm going to read the Amplified. If, if, for if many died through one man's falling away, his lapse, his offense, much more profusely did God's grace and the free gift that comes to the undeserved favor 
of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound and overflow to and for the benefit of many. I want you to get this sense of not just, not, not just grace, but overflowing, abundant grace of the fullness of him. Think, think, think about, I don't know if you've ever seen, not just, I'm not just talking about a lake, but when you go see the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and you see these huge waves, especially when it gets later in the day, right? And you get these big, huge waves, and they just keep coming. Bash! And it's overflowing. I mean, sometimes you have a seawall and it goes over the wall. Think about the grace of God as that abundant overflow that was there before you were born. And it is just overflowing your life. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 says, You were saved by grace through faith, not of works as any man should boast. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2 and 3 says, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse um. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and 4 says that God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. That comes from the grace of God according as he had chosen you. There is an abundance of grace. Now, I want you to catch this picture because you see, many times, sometimes, even though we are called grace people, yet some or the other, we fall for this deception that there is something we've got to do. And before we know it, we are right back into some kind of works mentality. Some kind of performance mentality. Not recognizing the lavishing grace of God that has provided all things that is already ours, that is poured out. Think of it as the air. When you were born again, the air was already here. Was it? Right? And, and you just, I mean, the oxygen, the nitrogen, whatever is there, it is free. It is the very atmosphere that you live in and you breathe it. You take a hold of what you need. Well, so is the grace of God. It is here. Say, it's here. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it. It's here. And every nitrogen, oxygen, healing, wholeness, whatever, preservation, deliverance, purpose, whatever it is, faith, hope, joy, it's all there. And what do you do? Breathe it. Say, breathe it. It's unearned. And everything has been given. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says, He's given unto you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. All things that pertain unto life and godliness. And the word godliness, I sometimes talk of it in the context of um, godliness meaning the manifestation of the God life, which it is. But it is also, he's, it is also the functionality of, of, of um, a God-like functionality. To be able to function like God. To function, to, the, to function like this nature inside of you truly dominates you. That it is Christ living through you. So, in other words, that he's given you everything that pertains unto life and everything that is necessary for you and I to have a God-like functionality. Does that make sense? Say, I got it. He's given you everything. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Hallelujah. And in this, everything includes a faith from God. Romans chapter 8, let's pick it up in verse 15. It says, for we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, that we are the sons of God. And if we are children, then we are heirs of God. Not just Abraham heir, but we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now think of this. In other words, then your spirit within you bears witness that and, 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 and what we see, we see that he is our father. He has adopted us. He has fathered us. We are his heirs. We have everything that he has, we have access to. Amen? So as a result of that, what might look like some difficulty, what might seem like a big problem, in the light of the reality of who we are, having access to him, his majesty, his excellence, his provisions, his, and this abundant overflow in grace, nothing is hard. Think about it. We don't have this spirit of bondage again to fear. That's not what we have. We have this spirit that says, he's my daddy. He loves me. His love is poured out. His grace is abundant. I have access to it. 
Luke 12, 32 says, ye, um, um, about ye, ye children, what does it say? Luke chapter 12, verse 32. It is the Father's good little flock. <laughs> it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There is a rest of faith that we have. This rest that says, he's my daddy. He's got everything. I'm his ear. I'm a joint ear with Christ. His grace is abundant. It has already been poured out. Even though I might have been out there in the pig pen, even though I might squandered my inheritance, nevertheless, his arms are still open wide. Nevertheless, I still got a ring. Nevertheless, I, I can come on home. Nevertheless, he is not judging me accordingly. He just says, I love you. Come on. This is what I've prepared for you. Grace is abundant. Say abundant grace. Now there's all of this stuff that has been given. And among that which is given is hope. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, you might flip over there. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be God and Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is also our Father, which according to his abundant mercy, we come to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy. We are not coming to the throne of judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Are you with me? We come boldly to this throne of, of, of grace, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. We are born again unto, unto what? To, unto a living hope. Unto a hope that is alive. Unto a hope that is eternal. Unto a hope that is perfect by the resurrection of the Lord of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are born again to this hope. And we are given this hope. This hope is God's hope. It is God's expectation. It is God's desire. It is God's dream. This hope is from above. He is the God of hope. Romans 12, 15 and verse 13. This hope is called in Galatians 5, verse 5 that we look at later. It's called the hope of righteousness. It is a hope that is connected and flows right out of this righteousness, this oneness that you have with God in Christ. That flows out of this new authority that you have. This freedom from guilt and condemnation. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I just remembered something. <laughs> I just remember Romans chapter 5 is a place I didn't go. I'm going to go back there then. <laughs> Let's flip back to Romans chapter 5. Hallelujah. Let me go back there. Yeah, this isn't done yet. Romans chapter 5. Let's go back to Romans chapter 5. There's some unfinished business over there. <laughs> All right. So Romans chapter 5. So I think we were about verse 15. If, I want, if through the offense of one... Many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of righteousness, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, had abounded unto many. And not as it was one that sinned, so is the gift. I'm back to talking about this abundance overflowing um, grace and, 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 and favor and kindness and provision. That is yours, that you've been born again to. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift of many offenses unto justification. Just as if sin have never been. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more. They which receive abundance of grace. The Amplified says, overflowing grace, unmerited favor, and the free gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Because of this abundant overflowing grace and this gift of oneness with God. Verse 18, therefore, as by one as by the offense of one, judgment came upon who? All men. Say all men. To condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift has come upon who? All men. Does that include the unsaved? Does that include the rich doctor? Does that include any family member that has not yet confessed Jesus as Lord? Has come upon all men. For what? Unto justification of life. Just as if sin has never been. So that they can have a right to that life of Christ. Amen? 
For as by one man disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous, and so on. But I want you to co- I wanted to come back and come back and, and let's pick that up. And that this grace that is abundant and what Jesus has done is not only for us, but it is also for the whole world. So here you and I, we, because of this abundance of grace, we are born again to this grace. And, and with this grace, he has given unto us all things. Bless us with every spiritual blessing. Everything that pertains unto life and all that is necessary for us to have this God-like functionality and to function like God. We are the sons of God. Amen. We are born again to a hope, God's expectation, God's dream, a living hope. It is called the hope of righteousness. In another place, it is called, it is, it is called the, Jesus himself is that hope. 1 Timothy 1 verse 1 says that Jesus Christ is that hope. Colossians 1 27 calls him Christ in you the hope of glory, of excellence, of the fullness. Christ himself is that hope. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now it also says, going back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 4, you are born again to this living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that faded not away. I believe that that hope is part of that inheritance. I believe that inheritance is the sum of that hope as well. So that this hope is incorruptible. It cannot be taken away. It, is, it, it doesn't fade away. Time don't change it. There is nothing the devil can do about it. It's God's expectation. It is in God and it is undefiled. It is incorruptible. This hope is so awesome that in Hebrews chapter 6, it says that, that this hope is to be an anchor for your soul. So that even in the midst of the storms of life, even in the midst of when there's the boisterous wind, when it doesn't look like it, when things are going wrong, when conflicts are happening, this hope is such that it can anchor your mind, your will, and your emotions. Amen? This hope is so awesome. It is God's hope. It is God's expectation. And God himself backs up this hope because he says, I swore by myself. In other words, I'm backing this up with my very own life. I'm watching over this word to perform it. I am behind this hope. I am the guarantee of this hope. So that you and I that are the heirs of the promise might have these two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. And you and I could be anchored by this hope that comes and proceeds from his very presence. So that in nothing are we shaken. Ephesians, um, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 says that you and I must do everything. You and I must be diligent to come to the full assurance of this hope. There is a full assurance about this hope. There is a certainty of this hope. This hope is settled. This hope is done. It is not seen. It is in God. But it is done. It is finished. It is established. Are you with me? All right. Now, as I was saying... As we continue in this study, we need to see there is this parallel track of truth, which is that it is his nature, his love, his hope, his faith, his life, his purpose, and it's no longer us, but it's Christ that liveth in us. And as we function in that nature, this reality of this consecration, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, here in our two, are we also called, we are called to holiness, we are called to sanctification, is, a, is, is much a part and a parcel of this thing. Because in the end of the day, in order to, func- in order to operate in this hope, the faith and, and everything else, the key is going to be functioning in this nature. And you can't function in this nature while I is so alive, if I is not crucified. Amen. Because we live the rest of our life not for the will of men, not for our own will, but for the will of him who loved us and gave himself for us. So that now that we live, we live unto him. So that's a parallel parallel track. That is why we go through this, this dying daily. That is why the Bible says this is the truth. Sanctify them. Set them apart with the truth. What is the truth? What are we talking about? Amen? All right. Jesus himself was so tremendously effective because this is where he functioned from. Jesus functioned from from a place 
where it was always, where it was God's perspective and God's, it was from this place and this operation, where it is not my will. I didn't come down here to do my own will, but it's the will of the Father that has sent me. My meat is to do the will of the Father. I only do what I hear from him. I only speak what I hear from him. I only do what I see him do. He says, even this doctrine is not my own. Amen? And, and, and as a result, the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 34, he had the Holy Ghost without measure. He was declared to be the Son of God with power by this, according to the spirit of holiness, by resurrection. That is also true for us. So I just want you to bear in mind this issue of this oneness, this issue of holiness, this issue of God only, this issue of sanctification that is an underlining theme in walking this out. Are we here? All right, so we have this hope because we have this hope that is from God. And, um, but here we are. Let me make another shift. Why is this becoming, why is this so important to know? Why don't we just stay in the place where we believe, we receive it, and we shall have it, and we declare, and we decree? Why don't we just stay there? That's fine too, you know. That's part of it. Hey, he's giving you richly all things to enjoy. Why don't we just lose our faith for, for another car, for another? Why don't we just do that? Because, here's why, as much as important and as wonderful as those things are, God wants you blessed. He takes pleasure in your prosperity. As much as that is so, we are in the point of time in the body of Christ and in the history of the church where we are coming in, we are heading to the finish line. And according to Ephesians 4 verse 13, we need to come into the full measure and stature of who? Christ. Amen? And therefore, there is some shifting that has to take place. There is a maturing that has to take place. There is a growing up into the head which is Christ. In you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right. So this hope is awesome. It's a helmet of salvation. It protects your mind. It is unseen. It is in God, but it is settled. Now, this hope from God, his, his expectation, this hope is pregnant with the will of God. Pregnant with the purposes of God. Now, you know and I know according to Matthew 6 and verse 9, that God's will and plan is that it might be on earth as it is in heaven. God's plan and purpose is that his purposes would be fulfilled. So here is the thing. The hope of God that we have, that God has given unto us, this hope that is from him, that is his hope operating in us, to anchor our soul, this hope that is embodies the very will of God and the purposes of God. God wants that hope and purposes and will fulfilled and manifested through you and me in this earth. All right? So what has God done? God has given to you and I his faith now so that the life we live, this life of Christ, is no longer us that live, but it's Christ that lives in us, and the life that we now live we live by, by the faith of the Son of God. He has now given us his faith that we can live this consecrated, holy, separated, resurrected life. He has given us his faith. And this faith is designed to bring fulfillment to the hope and the purposes of God. So the faith is his faith in us for his, to the fulfillment of his purpose and his hope. Hello? That is the reason why, hmm. okay, that is the reason why Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, sorry, Hebrews 6 verse 11 says, to have diligence to get a hold of the full assurance of this hope, and then it goes on to say that through faith and patience, you obtain the promises. Through faith and patience, that hope gets fulfillment. Amen? Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, faith is what? The substance of things hoped for. This faith that is from God is the substance of things hoped for, and it is the evidence of things not seen. Now, 
I want you to know, and this is the one of the, the most, I think the most important point that the Lord wants me to make today and to blast into your thinking is for you to know that you have this faith that is from God, this faith of God, this faith of Christ. You live by the faith of the Son of God for you to know that you have it. So let's just say that right now. I have faith that is from God. You remember in Mark chapter 11 when Jesus cursed the fig tree and so on and so forth? And then, you know, Peter marveled, oh, look, Jesus, the fig tree that you cursed, look at it, it's right up from the roof. And Jesus said in, in, in Mark, Mark chapter 11, 22, have faith in God or have the God kind of faith. This God kind of faith that did that, go, um, that's God kind of faith that did that, you have that faith. Say, I have the God kind of faith. I have faith that is from God. The Bible says, your life you live, you live by the faith of the Son of God. Ephesians, are we still in, are, 2 Peter, Peter, are we still there? 2 Peter 1 verse 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia. No, sorry, that's 1 Peter. Sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. With us, how? Through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. You and I have obtained like precious faith as Peter, as James, as Paul. It is the faith of Christ. It is the faith of God. It is a gift. And we obtain it how? Through righteousness. Because of this oneness that we have with God in Christ. Say, I've got the same faith. I have faith from God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 said, You are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift. Say it is a gift. I receive my gift. I have it now. I have the faith of God. It's in me. It's functional. Now, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. All right. Say I have the faith of God. I have the faith of God. Go to sleep tonight saying, I have God's faith in me. All right. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 says, Paul says, I say, Paul says, I'm talking now. <laughs> and I'm speaking through the grace that is given unto me. To every man that is among you. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But I'm saying, Paul says, I am saying through the grace of God given unto me to every one of you to think soberly. And I'm saying unto you to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Paul says, by the grace of God given unto me, I declare unto you that God has dealt to you the measure of faith. So I declare that right now. God has dealt to you, to every man, and you are every man, the measure of faith. Now I know some will say, well, in Thessalonians it says, some, but some men have not faith. Well, go check it out in some other versions. If some men are evil. Paul was praying in the, at the time that he would be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Now there are unreasonable and wicked men out there. Not every man loves God. Not every man has, um, ha has, has a devotion to God. Not every man declares that Jesus is Lord. Not every man will submit to him. However, God has dealt to every man, every human being on this planet, the witch doctors, people of other faiths, to, I don't even want to name their names. He has dealt to every man the measure of faith. What does that mean? This is important. There are people that we are believing God for. There are people that we think are so intellectual they can't be reached. Because we say the natural man cannot receive the things of God and they can only be spiritually discerned. Well, that might be so. Nevertheless, God has placed with every man the measure of faith, the capacity to identify that God that is endeavoring to reach him. God has placed within every man. It is within God's nature. And it is within his grace and his righteousness and his justice to deal to every man this measure of faith, this capacity 
of knowing and experiencing the living God. God has placed it within man. So you and I, you and I have that capacity. We have that faculty to focus and to believe God. Say, I got it. I have the faith of God. That means you've got the capacity to believe. That means what? And that is a God thing. You have, the, how does the faith of God operate? It believes that God is. So you have the capacity and the faculty and the focus to believe that God is. And to believe that God is a rewarder. You have the ability to believe that God is working all things together for your good. Because you are called according to his purpose. You have the capacity to believe that you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. You have the capacity to believe that with God, that all things are possible to you as a believer. You have that within you to believe that you are surrounded with favor as with a shield. And that God is watching over his word to perform it. Say, I believe. I, believe. I am a believer. I have that capacity. I have the gift, the measure of faith. I believe that God is. Amen. It is a gift, not of works, that any man should boast. This grace, it says now, remember this grace that is abundant that has been poured out? This amazing, overflowing, flooding, sufficiency, provisions, enablement, empowerment, fullness of grace and glory that has been lavished and poured out. It's available to all men. Somehow the devil has deceived mankind, including the church, that his grace is not so. He's got to work for it or it's not available to him. The world, they don't believe. Christians don't even believe to be able to go tell the world that because of what Jesus has done, you are justified to the very life of Christ. And that God was in Christ, not imputing your sins and trespasses against you. Why? Because the devil is a deceiver. He wants to bring that separation. He don't want people to get a hold of this reality that grace is abundant. And I've got faith, the faith of God, to access it. Now that grace works through faith. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works as any man should boast. That grace works through faith. And the grace is God's side. And it's God's part that reaches out to us. Amen? That reaches out to man. Faith is that gift and ability that God has put within us to receive everything that God has given us by grace. Say, I got that ability. I am able to receive everything that God has given to me by his grace. I have the faith of God. And I receive in Jesus' name. You see, the woman with the issue of blood, she saw Jesus in his grace. I mean, they had all these rules and regulations. She's unclean. She's not supposed to go outside. Twelve years had gone by and she grew only worse. But in spite of all of that, she heard Jesus. He's being, she heard about the gracious words. She heard about what he's doing. And somehow that faith within her caused her to believe and caused her to have the capacity to recognize that he is good and he is here. And if I could touch him, I see his grace, I'll be healed. And she saw God in his grace and Jesus saw her in her faith. He says, woman, your faith has made you whole. That faith receives from the grace of God. That faith takes from God. It says, yes, I receive it. I take it. I thank you, Lord. It is so. That faith says that grace is poured out on my life. And I receive it. Romans 4 verse 16 says, It is a faith that it might be by grace, that the promise might be true to all the seeds. Hmm. <laughs> Where are we? In Romans? Romans chapter 4. Let's flip over there. Romans chapter 4. Say grace. Faith. I receive everything that Jesus has paid for. He's paid for it. I'm an heir of God. I'm a joint heir with Christ. It all belongs to me. And I have the faith to receive 
In Jesus' name. Now, in Romans chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, that the promise might be sure to all the seed. It is a faith that can access this grace. And as it access this grace, so that the end result that the promise is true to all the seed. But remember, the promises are given unto us that by these we might what? Partake of the divine nature. So that faith accesses the grace so as to cause the manifestation of that divine nature where the promises is the vehicle to access that divine nature. And when that divine nature is accessed, the very promises are fulfilled. And we escape the corruption that is in the world. Same point. Grace, faith accesses it. Faith gives it substance, which we're going to get to. Faith is the proof and the evidence, and it will cause the manifestation on earth as it is in heaven, which is the, this is what it was all about. God wants you to know what is the hope to which he has called you. God wants you to know the faith that he has given you for the, to the intent that his purposes would be fulfilled and he would be glorified. Amen? All right? So, let's talk some more about this faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, They that come to God must believe that he is, which is what you got. So this faith, the grace is God's side, the faith is our side, but he has given us that faith. But faith is your responsibility and mine in responding. Sometimes in a cliche way you could say, faith is a responsibility that responds to God's ability. And that's good. Right? It's our responsibility. But it is our right response to God. And it responds and it says God is. It responds and it says God is true. It responds and it is this right response to God. It is this capacity to believe that God is true and every man a liar. I like this verse of scripture, especially when you have this thought in mind. That this faith that you have has this ability to respond to God correctly in spite of anything else whatsoever. Romans chapter 3 verse 3 says, For, if, for what if some did not believe? What if there's some... Some um, natural situation, some circumstances, some doctor's report. What if there's all of this natural stuff that speaks and preaches and declares and has a voice of unbelief? What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? No, no, it will not. God forbid. But let God be true and every man a liar. That's the kind of faith that you've got. This faith that is from God. It responds to God's expectation. It responds to that expectation that is from God himself. That expectation of that hope that is already settled in heaven. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Say I'm getting this. I, say, say grace is poured out on my life. And as I find out the details... I have got a divine hope that anchors my soul. A hope that is from God. And I've got the God kind of faith. Faith that is from God. The capacity to believe. And with that faith, I draw from the grace and bring fulfillment to God's hope. God's expectation. Hallelujah. All right. So Galatians chapter 5 verse 5 says, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness. This hope that comes out of this oneness, we wait for it and for its manifestation, the manifestation and the fulfillment, and we do it by faith. Verse 6, because you see, in Christ Jesus, it's not circumcision that produces. It's not uncircumcision that produces. It's none of that stuff that avail it. But it is faith. That work it by love. It is faith that is not a respect of persons. It is a faith 
that is energized by love, which is God himself. That faith is what produces. That faith is what brings fulfillment to the hope and the expectation and the dream so that God's purposes and God's will could be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is that faith that produces. Hallelujah. And there is a certainty. There is a confidence. There is an unshakableness in this faith that you have. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. You know the scripture so we can quote it. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And it is the what? Evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. Now, in court, if there is evidence and there is there's some eyewitnesses, there is some DNA, there is some pictures from the crime scene or whatever, and all of this is presented in court as evidence, right? Now, is there evidence for something that will be in the future? Or is the evidence proof of what already has taken place? So if faith is evidence, then faith must be proof of what's already done. Faith has got to be proof of what is done. It is evident. Therefore, there is something that is so certain and there is a confidence in faith. There is a full assurance. That is why it says in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 before verse 12, Come to the full assurance of the hope. Come to this place where you know hope. This thing is done. This thing is done in God. It is finished. You see, this faith knows it is finished. This faith knows that it is already done. It, come, it knows that the works of God were finished from the foundation of the world. This faith knows. Say knows. And because this faith knows, you see, I know we talk about believing. But the believing is actually, is, is, is a standard expression of, of knowing. In other words, faith knows. So we say faith believes. But it's greater than belief. Faith knows. Say faith knows. Say my faith knows. Do you know that you've been raised up together with Christ? Do you know that or you just think that? Do you know that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing? Do you know that by his stripes you were healed? Yeah. And because you know that, you express it by saying, I believe that. But say, I know. This faith knows. That's why it's called in Hebrews chapter 4, it is the rest of faith. It is done. It's not what he will do, but it is what is already done. That is why Philemon says, the communication of your faith becomes effective when you acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ. That is why Titus 1 verse 1 says that the acknowledgement of the truth is after godliness. In other words, when you acknowledge the truth, when you acknowledge what is done, when you acknowledge what the sacrifice of Christ has finished, when you acknowledge the truth, it will produce God-like functionality. It will cause you to function like God. You know how he functions? He calls those things that be not as though they were. And you will be declaring what he has already declared. You will be speaking not according to what is seen, but what according to what is seen in him. What is unseen but is in him. Because you know. Say I know. Faith believes that it is done. Now, if faith is proof, and faith believes it is done, then let me ask you something. If faith is proof, if faith is evidence, if faith believes that it is done, then let me ask you, if faith does not believe it's done, but believe it will be done, is it faith? If faith believes this is what is going to happen, is that faith? No. Hello? Oh, I'm trusting God. I know it's going to happen. No, it's already done. There is a better way to pray. There's a better way to talk. It is done. It is finished. Faith knows it is finished. Faith sees. What does faith see? 
Faith sees the unseen. Faith sees what God sees. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, which describes the faith, the same spirit of faith that we have in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13, we receive the same spirit of faith according as it is written, we believe and therefore speak. And 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18 amplifies it this way. It says, we do not look at the things that are seen, but we do look at something. Not at the things that are seen. That's not where our attention is. That's not where our focus is. That's not where we are locked in. That is not where we are. We, we don't bind ourselves to this. To this appearance. To this environment. To this natural. To what it feels like. To what the senses say. We don't bind ourselves to that. We don't let that demand and declare and, and, uh, and absorb our attention. But what are we doing? We are looking at the things that are not seen. The things that are eternal in God. This is temporal. It has a beginning. It has an end. But that which is eternal has no beginning, has no end. And it has the power. The things that are not seen has the power to change the things that are seen. So we are looking onto Jesus. We are looking onto the hope. We are looking at what is finished. Faith sees. What does it see? It sees the unseen that is in God. Faith knows. Amen? Now, if faith does not see what God is seeing, if faith is not seeing the unseen, because don't forget faith is the proof of the things not seen, and it will give substance to it. If faith is not seeing the unseen, are we in faith? Are we in faith or are we in the flesh? Say, I got faith. Now, you see, the enemy, he wants to deceive you and I. He don't want you to know that this grace is poured out, that it is abundant. He don't want you to get a hold of the reality that it is finished. He wants you to stay in the realm of if it be thy will, it might not be God's will. This sickness is for the, is for the glory of God. He wants you to stay in the, in, in the area of, of God is going to do it. And all of this stuff, he just says, keep them out of the truth that it is finished. And grace is poured out. And they've got a supernatural divine hope that is already settled in heaven. He wants your believing, your thinking, and your speaking to be controlled by the natural. What it looks like. What it feels like. I don't feel God is present. Well, that must be the reality. God's not here. Man, I don't feel nothing. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, I've been praying in tongues, but I don't feel nothing. Does that determine God? Well, this is what it looks like. I don't feel like praying. So that makes a decision for you. I don't feel like going to church. No, feeling has nothing. But the devil wants your feeling to decide to dictate your believing, to dictate your actions, to dictate your speaking. That's a lie. That's deception. Amen? He wants this stuff. That's his deception. But we are not looking at the things that are seen. We are looking at the things that are not seen. So here is what has to happen. This voice of the natural, you've got to shut it down. If that pain in your body keeps speaking and keep talking and keep dictating, it will eventually, and if it takes your focus, it will eventually take your tongue, take your speech, take your attitudes. The Bible says in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 38 to 39 in that area, about this faith, we walk, we live by faith, and we believe. We are not those that draw back, but we are those that believe Onto what? The saving of the soul. We stay in this place of believing until the mind, the will, the emotions, and the attitudes come in line and submit themselves to the truth that it is finished. Grace is poured out. I have got an, in, a, an inheritance. I've got a hope that is unshakable. Amen? All right. So... You must not, you got to shut down the voice of the natural. Glory to God. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. Amen? Now while you're turning there, let me say this. Is God concerned about our needs? <laughs> oh 
boy, oh boy. Honestly, I was really going to say, <laughs> man, can I even say this? Mm. No, I got to think of that one. <laughs> I got to think that one through. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that on record. <laughs> All right, anyway, Matthew chapter 14. <laughs> anyway, God has made provisions for your need. Let's put it that way. Amen? <laughs> glory, 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 glory. But now God don't want your need and this natural realm to dominate you, to dominate your attention, to dominate your time, to dominate your mind. He don't want that because otherwise you're looking and attending to the things that are seen as opposed to the things that are not seen. And this here will produce, this voice will produce unbelief. All right. Glory to God. This need, literally, is nothing more than an alarm. Don't ignore the alarm. But I'll tell you something about alarm. If, you, if you're in a building where, I mean, you know, it's monitored and they have security, and you go opening the wrong door, what happens? Beep, 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 beep. In other words, what is it saying? You're going through the wrong door. Hello? So need, that's not the door. Jesus says, don't be concerned about that. Seek first what? The kingdom. Don't let that distract you from the nature. Don't let that distract you from that which is eternal. It will fix the need. All right. Let's look at Matthew chapter 14. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. Matthew chapter 14, picking it up in verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship, go before him onto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, for it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, and said unto him, Oh, Peter, I am so proud of you. You stepped out of the boat and you dared to walk on water. Oh, Peter, I am so delighted. I knew you were going to be a rock. Is that what Jesus said? No, Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, wherefore did you doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. What's going on there? Jesus was basically saying, look here. I told you to come. I spoke to you, but you allowed the voice of the boisterous wind, the appearance of those crazy looking waves, you allow the voice of the environment to stifle and drown my voice that said, come. That voice, when I spoke to you, I give you power, I give you authority to walk on the environment. But instead, you listen to the voice of the environment. Why did you do that, Peter? Oh, you have little faith. Why? Why? What was the problem? You allowed the voice of environment to speak to you and silence his voice. He says, what, I'm, what I've given you to walk on, you allow that to speak. Stuff is going to happen in your life. Conflicts are going to take place. Stuff happens all the time, does it not? But don't let it speak to you. Don't let the voice of the conflict don't let it have access to you. You've got to be able to shut it down. How do you shut it down? We're going to mention two things, which is going to be your focus, and it's going to be your speaking. But number one, keep looking on to who? Jesus. The eternal. The hope. The things that are not seen. 
You've got to see the unseen. Mark chapter 8, verse 23. Um, another situation. Let's flip over there quickly. Mark chapter 8 and verse 23. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Mark chapter 8, verse 23. Mark chapter 8, verse 23. That don't look, that's not right. Sorry. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. All right. We're in business. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. And when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves. But he was asleep. And the disciples came to him and wake him up and said, Lord, save us. We perish. And he said again to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? And then he arose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Now when the natural environment has a voice, it will minimize the nature that is right in you, that is right there in your boat. And it will make your faith weak. Was Jesus present? Is the nature of God present? When the environment is allowed to speak? So what has to happen? If we do not silence that voice of the natural, that voice of nature, that voice of the environment, then your faith becomes strangled. And your faith is negatively affected. However, if you, on the other hand, stay looking at the things that are not seen, makes all the difference. Romans chapter 8. You got to see this. Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. It says, but not, not, Romans chapter 8, yes, verse 23, to no, 24, okay, all right, 24, <laughs> for we are saved by what? Hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man see it, why does he yet hope for it? What you see, let me ask you something, you have a situation going on, hope that is seen is not hope, what is seen? What is seen is exactly what you don't want. What you see is the problem. What you see is the waves. What you see is the conflict. What you see is the storms. That's not what you want, is it? So we are not looking at that. Hope that is seen is not hope at all. Because what a man sees, why does he yet hope for that? So what is the point? We got to keep looking on to Jesus. We got to look to that which is eternal. We got to look to the nature of God that has the power to change things. Because in him, all the promises are yes and amen. You get a bad diagnosis. A, a diagnosis, of whatever it is, is a problem. What do you do? Do you speak from the conflict? Or do you speak from in him? Do you declare something such as, well, by his stripes? By his stripes, this diagnosis will no longer be. Does that, rest, does that speak to the Spirit? Does the Spirit say yes and amen? No, it doesn't bear witness. The need must not dominate your attention and your speech. This horizontal, this natural must not. Your attention has to be on the hope. It has to be on Him. It has to be on, you know, the Bible says with Moses, and we don't have time to turn to it, but in, but. Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope that he might be the father of many nations. And the Bible says he considered not his own body now dead or the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't consider that. He didn't ponder on that. He didn't meditate on that. He didn't allow that to suck up his attention. But what he kept doing, he kept looking to God and that God is faithful, giving glory to God. And as a result of that, he grew strong in faith. Are you with me? That voice must be silence. You are dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Set your affections on the things which are above. Where is your focus? Where is your meditation? What do you do about this situation? All of a sudden, this is diagnosis. Oh, by his stripes, this here changes. That's weak. You ought to be saying something such as, I receive the nature of God that is in me. And I thank God for the supernatural working of that life and spirit that is within me. I thank you for that power that is within me that is, and that power that has been manifested in the name of Jesus. And that changes everything. And you keep speaking from here, not from here. 
You see, what the enemy wants you to do is speak from the conflict, speak from the environment. You need to speak from where you are in Christ. You need to speak from the nature of Christ. You need to speak from where he's raised you to. You need to speak from the hope. Your faith operates from him. Amen? We don't, are you not there waiting for God to, to make a decision? Oh, God, oh, Lord, let me know. No, 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 no. You're not waiting for God to make a decision on your behalf. You're not looking to God for a remedy. Why? Because the sacrifice of, when he gave the son Jesus as a sacrifice, he has lavished all grace, and he's already given you a remedy. Everything in the realm of humanity, he's already fixed it. So what does your faith say? I'm confident. I believe it's done. I've got the proof. I know it is so. And then your faith begins to think and talk and act accordingly and give substance to the hope. Romans chapter 8, I think we're still there. Verse 25 says, But if we hope for what we see not, we with patience do wait for it. When we are hoping for this which is in God that is done and settled with patience, with a tenacious conviction that where we bind ourselves to this hope, not to this, we bind ourselves to that hope, to that expectation that is from God, and we remain there until what? Until there is fulfillment. Through faith and patience, we obtain the promise. But that is based on what? The full assurance of the hope. You have need of what? Patience, perseverance, this tenacious binding yourself to that hope. So that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promises. What is the conclusion to this thing? Say, I got faith. This faith of God that is in you is designed to receive the grace that is poured out in your life. It is a faith that it might be by grace. This faith of God that is in you is designed to function through him, through that nature, from him, from that place, not here. You got it? This faith of God that is in you, it brings forth from the unseen into the natural realm. It is the substance of the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That which is eternal, the things that are not seen, to change the things that are seen. This faith that is of God that you have is designed to bring the manifestation of that life, that nature. And when that nature comes on the scene, what happens? You escape the corruption that is in the world. When Jesus, the healer, when his nature shows up, it's done. When provision, when he that is provision shows up, you are provided for and his provision shall be seen. Amen? Say, I got the faith of God. I have the faith of God. I have abundance of grace that is poured out of my life. Everything has been given. I don't have a spirit of fear, no spirit of bondage, no spirit of limitation. I have a spirit of adoption. God is my father. Everything that is in him is accessible to me. Everything that he has, I'm an heir to. I'm a joint heir of Christ. Grace is poured out. Grace has come to Jesus Christ. And I have the gift of faith. I have the capacity to believe according as he has spoken. And speak accordingly. And by that faith, I possess the grace. I receive from the grace. I bring fulfillment to the hope. The hope that is from God. And I remain in this place. I have a tenacious, a tenacity within me. And I bind myself to the hope. This expectation from God. I bind myself to the nature of God. That's where I live. That's where I function from. What is seen, don't move me. I'm established in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. What kind of faith do you have? Say, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live. I've got a new life. It's his life. It is the life of Christ, the nature of God. 
That's my life. I live through him. And I live his life by his faith. The faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. I accept that this is how it is. This is how it is. Hallelujah.